It's a pleasure and my distinct honor to introduce this fella. And trust me, I've never heard him speak, but we're going to get a good one, I think, based on what I read. Mr. Emir Kanner. In your Bibles this evening, I want you to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, since most of you don't know much about me beyond a short bio on there, I'll give a little bit of introduction that will lead into the message and reading of the word here in just a moment. But I am quite sure that in, what, eight years of this, Brother Earl, that you probably have not had a speaker whose name means the Prince of Islamic Conquest. I would <laughs> guess that's the case. <laughs> uh, so th there's my bio, if you want to know. Uh, uh, my father is Turkish, my mother is Swedish, my wife is Czech. And our kids will need a psychologist at some point in their lives. Uh, my father and, and mother uh, met at a university in Stockholm, Sweden. And my mother converted to become a Muslim, did the Shahada, the Creed of Islam, and uh, became a Muslim. They came over to the United States to plant mosques. Uh, back in the 1960s, there were only 100 mosques in America. Uh, today, there are nearly 3,000. And uh, as they were planting a mosque, God was doing a work that they did not know of. Uh, there was a teenager who continually invited me to church during the busing days of evangelicalism. Do you remember when everybody bought a bus and invited whatever scallywag there was to get on the bus and get to a revival service? I was one of those scallywags. And, and they invited me to every little event this little Baptist church had up in Ohio where we finally landed and settled. Uh, invited me to things I'd never heard of before. Invited me to a lock-in. I, I didn't know what a lock-in was. It's in the Bible, by the way. If you just look under the word hell, you will find... <laughs> look, someone in our age group had to invent this thing, but that's, I don't know if that's from the Lord. I mean, who had the idea, let's get him to church, Turn out the lights, lock the doors, and see what happens. Whoever's idea that was. But they invited to me everything. And this is God's good providence because the church where I was saved, where God redeemed me from a false God named Allah to the one true living God, was not the church you would have picked. It was a church he picked. I can promise you it wasn't the church you would have picked. My pastor was an ex-moonshiner who got saved. You wouldn't have picked him. His wife was a Japanese woman who was a Buddhist who got saved. Inside the church was the weirdest group of believers I have ever met in a small church. I mean, you had a woman who is of German descent, just came from Germany, who loved to sing country western songs. <laughs> Do you know how weird it is to hear George Strait with a German accent? <laughs> and... Uh, it was during revival services. Do you remember revival services when churches of many denominations would go for a week or two weeks? They wouldn't give up on anyone, so they kept on going. Even if there were no lost people in a the crowd, they'd give invitations, they'd preach the word until the Lord did a work within those churches. And my brothers and I, there are three of us, I'm the youngest. I was the only one born in the United States. I love to remind them of that because you know what that means. I can be president. <laughs> They can't. They can be governor of California if it's still a state in 10 years, but they can't be president. And I'm so grateful for a church that reached out to me, saved me. Uh, and I was born again on a Thursday night revival meeting. And it was a, a very, very special time uh, in our lives. And, and I won't share the whole story because I want to get to the message. But because of it, you pay a sacrifice when you come out of Islam. Uh, when you come out of Islam, you usually lose your family. I lost my father. So you lose. You lose a little bit. Not like across the world. Remember, the greatest sacrifices are those who are across the world, and they come to Jesus. Not in a place where you have freedom, but in a place where you have persecution, where one out of eight Christians today wake up not knowing if they will be arrested, fined, imprisoned, or worse. But here, because of the men and women who fight and have fought, within our military who have fought for our freedoms, I got to be saved. And sure, I lost my father, and he told me I wasn't his son, but I got to live my faith without persecution because of those. And so 
You can imagine when the uh, flag flies during July 4th in the Canner home. Uh, it is a flag we will wave heavily, loud, and proud without any apology because, listen, while America has her warts, America has given more freedom to more people in human history than any other country in the world. And that wasn't just the notion to which I came out of the oppression of Islam that came out of my wife's homeland. You see, because I, I met my wife on a mission trip to the Czech Republic, and we dated for a week and got married. That's not a recommendation. That was just a true story. I have two daughters. That's not going to happen. I promise you. I have enough jihad me and left in me that if anybody ever tries to marry my daughters after a week, that, that wouldn't happen. But she was, she was my translator. She came up. I was supposed to be preaching a little bit, giving the Jesus film to a place that's 90% atheist today. And, and I'm waiting for it, waiting for my translator. Here she comes. She's now my wife. And uh, here we are, three uh, children later. Uh, and I never planned to be in the mountains of North Georgia. I'm just two and a half miles, two and a half hours away from here. I never planned to be in the country. I am a proud Turkish redneck now. <laughs> I never planned to be. The Lord moved us to True McConnell University in the mountains of North Georgia. Usually you only know where we are by two things. Have you ever heard of Cabbage Patch Dolls? That's Cleveland, Georgia, or if you ever resorted out in Helen, Georgia, that's where we are. And my, when my wife and I came there, we just have one goal in mind. How do you fight for this generation? That's an entire issue, as I put on, on social media today. I have never seen. Think about the generations that are in here. I have never seen a generation so quickly and viciously attacked as this generation. So if that's the case, what they need are warriors for Christ who will lift up and stand up and fight for them. Amen. Regardless of what happens, I would rather be left on the battlefield wounded or killed than to stand back as a spectator while the devil has his due with a new generation. So... With that said, you are now in God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is the benediction to an entire book that the Apostle Paul is preaching uh, to a very difficult church just planted about 10 years previous, and they have gone through the muck and mud of the world. They are in the cosmopolitan town of Corinth. And like many of our churches in America today, instead of influencing the world, the world had influenced them. But the apostle did not give up on them. And instead, he writes these words that you and I will read. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 through 18. So my question for the hour is simply this. How do you become refreshed to go to war? How do you become refreshed so you go to war? 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, this is what the apostle says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I urge you, brethren, that you know the household of Stephanus, that is, the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such, and to everyone who works and labors with us, Oh, I'm glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for what was lacking on your part, they supplied. And then that key word to which we will concentrate this evening, for they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge such men. You not only know the word refreshment, you've experienced it. If you've been born again, blood-bought by the Lord Jesus Christ, it's what he has done to all of us. It's what he spoke to us in Matthew chapter 11. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's the same Greek word. I will refresh you. See, the warriors that are best in battle are the ones who are reminded that they've been set free from sin. So step back for the time that the Lord saved you. Do you remember it? 
Do you remember the day that Jesus took you from death to life, from bondage to freedom? Do you remember when all of the sins that were upon your shoulders was lifted off of your shoulders and they were placed on his shoulders? Do you remember when he said those who believe in him will have the right to be called the son of God? Do you remember when you became a new creature and all the old things passed away and everything became new? Do you remember that day? Because that day wasn't supposed to be a singular day because you're supposed to die daily. And so when you woke up this morning and you died daily, you again were reminded he saved you, he's going to sanctify you, and one day he'll complete you. And those are all three promises of equal value, that in the same way he saved you back then, is the same way he sanctifies you today, in the same way he sanctifies you now, he will glorify you. There's no uncertainty to the promises of God. You are as guaranteed of heaven when you are saved as you are now, as you will be in the future. And we are not looking for the Antichrist, but we're looking for the Christ. He'll come for us. That same empowerment upon our lives through he, the Holy Spirit, is supposed to give us enough power, not for ourselves, but so it would overflow for the sake of others. And that's what the Corinthian church had lost. You can take a pericope of the Corinth letter and you become broken at the sinfulness that the Corinthians had. The first two chapters of 1 Corinthians, it's reminded how selfish they became. The second two chapters is how worldly they became. Now, when you blend those two things, selfishness and worldliness, you have lost all power to go into battle and you have to step back and recognize that you have no power but to lose. And that's what happened in their church and in their lives and in our families. If you want to know why our families are so broken and so battered, why our churches likewise, while denominations across the board likewise, it's when you blend selfishness and you blend worldliness you will get the rest of 1 Corinthians in any society. What did it look like? 1 Corinthians 5, sexual immorality. Mark it down. The first thing to fall when people take their eyes off of Jesus is the physical. The first thing to fall are the eyes, that flesh that falls before you, and then everything else breaks. In America, that didn't happen 20 years ago. It happened perhaps 80 years ago. Then came the rest of 1 Corinthians. Suing each other, 1 Corinthians 6. Divorcing each other, 1 Corinthians 7. Becoming desensitized in the mind, 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. As fathomable as it is to me, by 1 Corinthians 10, they step away from the Lord their God and worship false gods. I can't get that. Because I did that. For the first portion of my life, I bowed my knee to a false God named Allah through a false prophet named Muhammad and a false way to salvation that somehow you can work your way there. And I can't ever imagine going back. What would I go back to when the grace of God has saved me, when he speaks to me every day, when I get to worship him when I wake up in the morning? How could anybody get so callous and cold and broken that they move on out to a false God that's dead and doesn't speak? but they did. So they took the Lord's Supper in vain, 1 Corinthians 11. They became just paganized in their spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. But here's the beauty of it all. You would wonder after reading those first 14 chapters, so Paul, why don't you give up? In our natural mind, wouldn't you? I would. Why don't you give up? Paul, why don't you give up on the Corinthian church? Why don't you give up on your children and grandchildren? Because 1 Corinthians 15. Swedish is my first language, English my second language. The three greatest words ever uttered in English language, he is risen. As long as the resurrection is true, never give up on anyone. Never give up on any family member, never give up on any friend, never give up on any stranger, never give up on any country, never give up on them. The resurrection proves that you can hold down truth, you can suppress truth, you can try to hide truth. But it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. 
That's why all of a sudden the turn, you read this whole thing and you, you almost slouch your shoulders and bend your knees a bit. But by 1 Corinthians 16, it becomes an encouraging letter that leads to a revival within the Corinthian church. So let's walk very quickly through this small paragraph in Scripture. What does it take to go to war and fight for this generation? It's what I've, I've done every year for 23 years now. What do you do because you're going to lose some battles and you're going to win some battles. You're going to see some students who walk away and become agnostics and atheists and pantheists and everything in between. But you also see those who are atheists, agnostic, and pantheists become Christian. So how do you ensure you go to battle properly? Here's what the apostle says. First part of verse 13 gives you the first picture. Watch and stand fast in the faith is a key term for war, it's vigilance. Any warrior knows the first thing you do in order to go to battle is not first to go to battle, but to ensure you're ready for battle. And watch is not an offensive term, it's a defensive term. Watch is not about your emotions or your feelings, it is about your mind. The first thing you do is you steal your spine and prep your mind in order to go to war. Watch is defensive. Stand fast in the faith is offensive. Watch is about your mind. Stand fast in the faith is about your emotion. Watch means we better be ready to have the armor of God on and all of it. Unless you have the helmet of salvation and the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of the gospel of peace, unless you have all of it, the devil has a simple time to aim his arrow wherever you're missing and it's over. But you also have to remember something. Wherever you are strongest in your faith is where the devil wants to attack and get its greatest, his greatest joy. We always think that he's going to attack where we are weakest, and that is certainly true. But the devil gets its greatest joy, his greatest joy at attacking you where you're strongest to knock you down. Because he's at war too. Defense means that while we always assume the world comes into the church and corrupts the church, if we are not ready, we will go into the world and corrupt the world. I have lived in Christian higher education since 1999. I have taught and taught and taught tens of thousands of students. And what I know is some of the books that you may or may not know have corrupted generations for a long time. But of all books over the last two, three, four, five hundred years that I have seen that has done more damage than any other book, it's a book published in 1859. It was written by Charles Darwin and it's entitled The Origin of Species. In one fail swoop, Charles Darwin, the naturalist, has convinced the majority of each generation subsequent to him that you are not the creation of God to glorify God, that you are not created for a purpose and a goal and joy and hope. Instead, you and I are mere accidents, coincidences over billions of years of evolutionary trail of blobs and species. In one fell swoop, it seems, Darwin was able to take God not merely off his throne, but take him in the back so no one would notice him again. But nobody ever asked a second question about Darwin. Dr. Darwin, before you went to the Galapagos Islands and before you studied and observed nature, what did you want to be? Oh, that's right, he, he wanted to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dr. Darwin, what happened? He was sitting in a pew in England and his pastor compromised the word of God. And he not merely compromised the word of God, he compromised it from the very first verse. And mark it down, in this generation, if the devil can get you to doubt the first verse of scripture, he can get you to doubt any verse of Scripture. Because without the creation of God, there is no redemption in God. See, here's the ugly tr uh, truth of church history. It's not that Darwin gave birth to evolution. It's that the church 
gave birth to Darwin that gave birth to evolution. No wonder why the apostle says, watch. Watch your pulpits and your Sunday schools and your deacon bodies. Watch everything in between because many times it's the church that doesn't defend the gospel of Jesus Christ and becomes in some way progressive and tries to become relevant. Mark it down. The church that tries to become relevant will become irrelevant in the eyes of God. You don't need to add anything to this word. It is always sufficient. It is always true. And it can always change lives. You can't any way beautify it any more than it is. Watch is defensive. Stand fast in the faith is offensive. What a lot of this generation doesn't know is the key to faith is not merely here, but here. If your passion doesn't balance your mind, you and I will never last in Christianity because we are in a relationship and any relationship requires passion. Anyone who's in a relationship knows it. Husbands, you're here with your wives tonight. Imagine if you were to go home after the service this evening and take to your room. And I want you to, here's a recommendation. Look romantically in your wife's eyes and say this, honey, I love you because I have to. Here's what's not going to happen tonight. <laughs> Passion will not happen. Because we're in a relationship with the living God. A God who not only saved your mind, but the entire part of your being, including the emotions, including the feelings. I told you I dated my wife for a week, and it's true. Met on there and... and uh, didn't date during a mission trip, right? You're supposed to win people to Jesus, not take them home with you. So we're, I got home where I was a professor at a seminary, and, and she was over in, in Czech Republic, and uh, I, I was flying back over there in six weeks, and we dated for that one week. And I knew I wanted to marry her, but I wasn't going to fly over there for a woman to tell me no. I got that for free on this side of the ocean. I wasn't going to pay $1,000 for a woman to tell me no. So... Now, I'm going to tell you how old I am by this illustration. We were talking by AOL Instant Messenger. <laughs> Anybody remember when you had to pay for the internet by the minute? And the obscene costs of the internet back then in the uh, early 2000s? That, that was then. So I, I'm not a romantic. You probably can figure that out by now. I am somehow a Christian Neanderthal of sorts. And, <laughs> And I just simply blurted out to my wife one evening, Hannah, would you ever think of marrying someone like me? Now, that's nobody, and that's no woman's dream, right? Oh, I can't wait till a man asks me to marry me over the internet, right? It's, nobody, nobody ever says that. Well, my wife, being a godly woman, and, and said, well, that's between my Lord and I. I need to go pray about it. <laughs> Click, she's off. And I'm in deep trouble, right? I'm staring at this old computer, my, my palms are sweaty. I think I just made a massive mistake in my life. I'm waiting for her to come back. It felt like eternity, and she, she finally came back. She said, the Lord spoke. I said, great, what did he say? She said, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Don't you ever wish you'd memorized all of Scripture so you could have just... <laughs> so, <laughs> and I said, well, what did he say? 1 Samuel 1, 16 and 17. The character's name is Hannah, as my wife's name. And the Lord said this to her. The Lord gives you the petition of your heart. And we were, knew we were going to be married. And I was so grateful the Lord did not give her Matthew 16, 23. Get thee behind me, Satan, because you're an offense to me. <laughs> and a week from now, we celebrate our 22nd anniversary. That's the joy of passion. How do you fight for this generation? Watch and stand fast in the faith. My fear for the churches are they're just not ready for battle. They're not preparing their minds, and they're certainly not preparing their hearts. So even if they decide to go to war, it'll be short-lived until they have to go home. That's vigilance. Secondly, 
I love the old King James at the end of verse 13 where it says, quit you like men. In the New King James and other translations, it says, be brave, be strong. It's not merely vigilance. It's a reminder of victory. Christians are so defeated today because they forget that the faith they have is an overcoming faith, is a victorious faith, is a living faith, is a miraculous faith. And they have forgotten it because they have been so beat down, worn down, and burned out that they can't get their chins up to recognize what the Lord has been telling them all along. That you're not brave and strong in and of yourself. You let go. And the moment you let go, you realize the Lord never has. That Christianity is not a crutch. It's a wheelchair. That you are either fully dependent upon him or you're not dependent upon him at all. And be brave and be strong is not a push for you to get better and bigger and wiser. Be brave and be strong is that your faith gets stronger. Your trust gets stronger. Your surrender gets deeper. Your love for loss gets deeper. Be brave and strong and you want to take a step back and go, but Apostle Paul, who are you talking to? fornicators, adulterers, idolaters, all the rest that you just said? Are you telling me that the Lord is the type of God that takes idolaters worshiping false gods and those who are breaking up families and suing each other and in a millisecond will turn them around and use them again? That's exactly the God we worship. That's exactly the God that stops everybody in their track. And when repentance happens and the 180 happens, he uses you because he doesn't use you according to your past experience, but on his own character. I love to watch the transition of 1 Corinthians to 2 Corinthians that the most selfish people came to the most selfless people. They gave even out of their poverty, if you remember, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. That the most worldly became ambassadors for Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Be brave and strong wasn't written for a single individual. This is where we forget in the battle. You and I are not mercenaries and we're certainly not snipers. The only way to win is to win together. That's why the devil takes great joy in splitting up churches and splitting up families and splitting up believers. Perhaps the number one lesson I've learned through uh, this pandemic is that every lame excuse of why people shouldn't go to church has to be absolutely decimated, destroyed, and never heard from again. I've heard them all. You've heard them all. I don't like their hypocrites in the church. Can someone name me one place in the world where there aren't hypocrites? Just one. I don't like that they're crazy people in the church. Yep. Over the past 20 years, I've preached at about 1,000 churches. Every church. Every church has got crazy people. <laughs> They're the people, they don't look at you. They look through you. Every church, someone, you know them, right? In your churches, if I were to pause and say, now think of a crazy person in a church or in here. <laughs> now don't point this way. Look this way. Don't be looking around. <laughs> You got the crazy person? Because here's a hint. If there's no one in your head, it's you. You're it. After being saved for more than 30 years, you know what I know? I'd rather be in here and in my local fellowship with fallen but faithful believers than by myself out there. The devil's greatest trick in Christianity is not to convince you of heresy. The devil's greatest trick is just to shut you up and silence you by creating solitary confinement within you. Because once you're in solitary confinement, you don't think you can talk to anybody. And the sullenness of life takes over the victory that the Lord has given you, and it's over. One of my daughters had a trick when, she, when we were growing up and we were still in Texas. You probably had kids like this. She had a bedroom upstairs. We were downstairs and she would sneak out of her room. We had all the gadgets. Never worked. She would sneak out of her room. She'd walk down creaking stairs. They wouldn't creak. She'd open up the door to our bedroom. We wouldn't hear it. 
She wouldn't come up to her mother's side of the bed. No, she'd come up to my side of the bed. She'd get within three millimeters of my face. And she wouldn't say a word. It's three o'clock in the morning. And she just stares at you. <laughs> Finally, you know where you almost half wake up. And you wake up and you open your eyes and there she is. Three-year-old Daniela just staring at me. And I'm still in dreamland. All I can think is, you know, Chucky? Right? Is this what's going <laughs> You know what she would do? She would never say a word. She'd go back up the stairs, fall asleep, and never say one word. Do you know what happens when the devil wins? It's not that you walk off into heresy. It's that you'll never say a word. You'll never stand for the faith. You'll never share the faith. You'll never serve others. That's the greatest trick. That's why he says, be brave, be strong. There's victory in Jesus Christ. And then ultimately, the last of this passage says something I learned by moving to the south. Verse 14. Let all that you do be done with love. Now, I knew love as Muslim. Conditional love. Conditional love is based on the fact that you must do something in order to be loved by your God. Every other religion besides Christianity says, if you do this, God will love you or the gods will love you. In, in the Quran, the Holy Book of Islam, they would say, Allah loves those who do righteous deeds. Did you hear it? He'll love you if you first love him. The Lord put that all on his head in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That you didn't love him first, but he first loved you and gave himself to be a propitiation for our sins. It's unconditional love. It's a love without any caveats. It's a love without any pauses. It's a love that Christian churches have to get back to. I grew up in Ohio. That makes me an Ohio State Buckeye. That's what we rooted for. I rode on a van here with Alabama fans somewhere in here. I was listening to me. They had a hat on that said A. And the bus driver said, does that mean Atlanta Braves? And they got insulted because right? they had an A on their hat, which I know why Alabama has A's on their hat is because it's only grades a football player gets. It's an A within the class at Alabama, but that's different. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm Ohio State. We can't win anything, right? What are we? We're, we're not the Crimson Tide, the Bulldogs. Or, we're the Buckeyes. Do you know what a Buckeye is? A worthless nut. That's what we are. The Ohio State worthless nuts. That's what we named each other. Why don't just name ourselves the flying squirrels while we're at it? This is just an oddity. But the Lord told me to move down south. I arrived in Wood, North Carolina. Population 118. No joke. I knew it because I was a student pastor of the only church in the town and when a woman got pregnant, we changed a sign. <laughs> Small town. Now, here's the neat thing about it. Right here I was, a Muslim family, different culture, different language. But they treated me like I was their own. Now, they, they wouldn't do everything with me. They, they wouldn't take me hunting. They wouldn't put a gun in a former Muslim's hands. <laughs> But they took me snipe hunting. <laughs> you must be a deacon. And, um, I became so fascinated with Southern culture. Because these people in the South, you're, you're the most innovative people in all the world. It had to be a Southerner who discovered milk. Had to be. <laughs> Two older men, five o'clock in the morning, standing out in the pasture, leaning against a fence. One man looks at the other and says, I wonder what happens when you squeeze that. And, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not part of the sermon. <laughs> Here's the neat thing. So when I moved down, the Lord also spoke to me and said, move your grandmother down. Now, my grandmother was from Stockholm, Sweden. She adopted my mother um, and uh, 
my grandmother was in her 90s. She had literally sold all that she had in Sweden in order we can put food on the table as a poor immigrant family. So grandma meant everything to us. She was the stabilizer. She was everything. So it wasn't hard to move her down, but she didn't speak any English. Not one word. She answered the phone for some reason, never spoke any English. I thought, Lord, I don't, I don't know. Grandma's lost. She doesn't know Jesus. And what in the world are people would North Carolina going to do with, it, with this woman? I mean, it, they're weird people. And what, they took me to a pig picking. I didn't know what a pig picking was, but Muslim, right? Had some catching up to do on some pig. So, <laughs> a year after I, uh, I moved her down with me and she lived in my trailer with me, those sweet people of that church so loved on her, never spoke her language, she never spoke their language, that they loved her to Jesus. And at the age of 92, she placed her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let all that you do be done with love. As long as there's breath in the body, there is hope for the soul. The end of the passage, the apostle writes and brags on three people, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. Who are they? We don't know much about them. We know about one of them. Fortun or, uh, Stephanus was baptized by the apostle Paul. That's the only one we know about. 1 Corinthians 1 mentions him. That's it. The other two, Fortunatus and Achaicus, we know zero outside of Scripture, inside of Scripture, beyond what's here. So why would he mention them? Because it's a good answer. What's life about? Life is not about accolades and accomplishments. Life's about serving Jesus. And somewhere in the world is a common tombstone for these two, and all you would know about them is they serve Jesus. And that's enough. As one missionary put it, the whole goal of life is that Jesus is remembered and you can be forgotten. At the end of the passage, the apostle finishes up and says, for they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. Two keys to that. One, remember, if the apostle Paul needed to be refreshed, so do we. The apostle Paul had done nothing wrong. But if you serve Jesus, the more you pour into others, the more you serve your church, the more you love on the lost, the more you'll need to be refreshed. Because it is far more tiresome to fight a spiritual battle than it is ever a physical battle. The second thing is the apostle then says, therefore acknowledge such men. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Every student at my university has to take a class on the martyrs of the church. It's required. It's what I did my dissertation on. It's what I love most. I love to see those who sacrifice most. We even name our buildings after those who are martyrs, not on those who gave the most money. I love to teach a class, although I'm on the road much now and can't teach. One of my favorite movements is what's called the Anabaptist movement. That's a believer's movement within the Reformation of people who did not hide behind government. They'd gone against infant baptism because in that time, infant baptism said that it saved you. And they said, no, 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 only Jesus can save you. And for that, they paid the highest price. One of my favorite characters, a man named Felix Montz. Don't know when he was born. Nobody cared. We think somewhere around 1500, he was born in Zurich, Switzerland. The reason nobody cared about him was not merely because he wasn't cared for in that society, but because he was the illegitimate child of a Catholic priest. Right in the middle of Zurich is a beautiful church called the Grossmünster, the big church in German. Behind the Grossmünster, the next building back was the brothel. The brothel was set right beside the church so the priest can go out the back door and sleep with women. They had become corrupt. Felix was the consequence of that. So nobody cared for him. But a beautiful thing in God's eyes, the priest left and a preacher of the gospel came in, a true preacher. All of a sudden, Felix, growing up, is in his late teenage years, and he wanders into a 7 a.m. Bible study. He hears the gospel. He's saved. The rest of his life looks like this. Preach the gospel, get arrested, be tortured, 
told not to share Jesus, be released from prison. Preach the gospel, get arrested. Be tortured, told not to share Jesus, be released. Preach the gospel. Finally, they had enough. They knew he wouldn't give up. So on January the 5th, 1527, they decide to exterminate Felix Motz, somewhere around the age of 26. They make a mockery of him. And they drag him through the streets of Zurich, Switzerland. And as he's walking through the cobblestone streets, you start to hear where he gets his boldness from. His mother, who was one of the concubines of that brothel, was led to Jesus by Felix's best friend, Conrad. She was not going to shut up. And so as he's walking by her, she whispers into his ear, Felix, stand firm, Felix. Whatever you do, Felix, just stand firm. He walks right past her. She could have prayed for his deliverance, and that would have been right. She could have prayed for his boldness, and that would have been right. But all she did was call out to Felix. Felix, stand firm, Felix. Whatever you do, Felix, stand firm, Felix. He crosses over. They put him in a dinghy boat. They take him in the middle of the Limont River, the shallow river that crosses straight through the beautiful city of Zurich. They tie a noose around his neck, hoist him back into the water where they'll drown him. And the last words he hears are from his mother. Felix, stand firm, Felix. Whatever you do, stand firm. They bury him in a common cemetery, no name, no recognition, no accolades, so that he would be forgotten. 495 years later, therefore acknowledge such men. I have no idea what the Lord has in store for this generation, but I promise you, unless the generations that have come before them stand with them, pray for them, shout for them, encourage them, love them, and fight for them, the next generation will not see what your generation saw. But if you stand, then the Lord will work honoring your generation for the next generation, and this country will have hope. The only hope we will ever have as a country will not be found in Washington and will not be found in the state congresses. They will be found in our churches. America will rise and fall in our churches. Nowhere else. Therefore, stand firm. God bless you guys.